What is pilpul? That's the subject of this lecture. So the official definition of pilpul is that it's a method of disputation among rabbinical scholars regarding the interpretation of Talmudic rules and principles of scripture that involves the development of careful and subtle distinctions. Basically, it's the same thing as casuistry, which is the reasoning from case law. You take cases of law, you derive general principles from them. The informal definition of casuistry, which applies to pilpul, is when you're splitting hairs in order to just prove things that aren't even there. So let's get into more detail about that. So I think the best example of pilpul, or the best introduction, is an example from Heim Potok's The Chosen. It's a book written in the World War II period about this modern Orthodox kid, Ruvain Malter. Um, and he becomes friends with this ultra-Orthodox, this Hasidic uh, kid, Danny Saunders. And it's sort of the interplay between the more modern Orthodox and the Hasidic world. And so this is, I believe, Ruvain's father who describes Pilpul to him. He says, we do not survive disaster by appealing to invisible powers. We are as easily degraded as any other people. That is what happened to Polish Jewry. By the 18th century, it had become a degraded people. Jewish scholarship was dead. In its place came empty discussions about matters that had no practical connection with the, dis the desperate needs of the masses of Jews. Pilpul, these discussions are called, empty, nonsensical arguments over minute points of the Talmud that have no relation at all to the world. Jewish scholars became interested in showing other Jewish scholars how much they knew, how many texts they could manipulate. They were not in the least bit interested in teaching the masses of Jews and communicating their knowledge and uplifting the people. And so there grew up a great wall between the scholars and the people. It was also a time of terrible superstition. Our people believed that there were demons and ghosts everywhere that tortured the Jew, racked his body, and terrorized his soul. These fears affected all Jews, but they affected the unlearned masses most of all, or worst of all. At least the scholar had his pilpul to keep him alive. So this is around the time of there was a failed rebellion. I believe it's a failed Russian rebellion against the Polish overlords. The authorities cracked down the Jews, and the Jews retreated into mysticism. And this was around the time of the Baal Shem Tov, the sort of founder of Hasidic Judaism. And so, instead of doing real, you could say real scholarship or more academic scholarship, they got into the ability to just prove any anything and everything from the text with their careful and clever reasoning. Like the idea of Pilpul is proving something and its negation from the same text using the accepted rules. So it's a clever type of verbal manipulation. And so this is and from a later chapter, when they start applying it, uh, Ruvain is discussing a uh, Talmudic passage and its harmonization. And so the professor like asks him about why he doesn't like this uh, explanation of a passage. Uh, and the professor is like, hey, why is this thing pilpul? What's wrong with his explanation? And Ruvain says, I answered it was strained that it attributed nuances to the various conflicting commentaries that were simply not there, and that therefore it was not really a reconciliation at all. Again, the sort of the his understanding of pilpul is that it, it just gets into contradictions, and you're like, okay, how do I resolve this? It ha there has to be some way. So let's just force some sort of harmonization. Let's microanalyze the text for the tiniest minutia. And we'll use that to create a harmonization. And so that that's, I think, the best introduction to the idea of Pilpul. So there's a, this guy, Heim Soloveitchik, who also discusses Pilpul. It was more common among Ashkenazic Jews, the Jews of Poland and of Germany, than the Sephardic Jews, the ones of Spain. The, uh, the Ashkenazim were more into the mysticism. And so... He says the rabbis reinterpreted the laws to fit the needs of their people. And there's two ways that the Ashkenazim did this. The first is Haki Garcinan. Read the text this way. And this was developed by Rashi, although he... Uh, I don't know if he was the first. I know Maimonides did it as well, although with more care. And so Neusner mentions this in his own uh, works. Rashi corrects the Talmudic text over 2,300 times. Um, the Vilna Talmud, 
it's a, a Talmud or a version of the Talmud, lists the changes to the t text of the Talmud made by authorities such as the Gra, the Bach, the Maharsha, uh, the, uh, with the Rishash and others. Um, and they may be corrected because they run counter to accepted tradition. Now Maimonides also corrected the text, but he was a little more careful. Uh, he looked for manuscripts that had the readings because there wasn't just one manuscript of the Talmud at the time. Anyone who has any like historical knowledge will tell you there's sort of like differing texts of the Talmud, and if a passage looks wrong, at least Maimonides would try to find some version of the text. With with Rashi, there were like even if every single text said one thing. Uh, but it ran against tradition, he would correct it on the basis that, like, there's no way there could be these contradictions. So, obviously, somebody misprinted it somewhere, this has to be the right printing. And there's all these other sages as well. So, the view of Haki Garcinan is actually you're just changing the text itself. You're just changing the text to fit your own needs. Uh, many anti-missionaries actually attribute this to the New Testament authors. And they're projecting. They're projecting what the rabbinic tradition has done to the Talmud. Uh, the second is Lavdavka, called Not Exactly, and this was developed by the Tosafists well after Rashi. So Rashi seemed to be a high enough authority, since he was earlier on, that he could change the text. The Tosafists were kind of lower authorities because they came later, and so instead of changing the text, they would just uh, have, have their creative liberties with the interpretation in order, again, to make the text fit whatever is the accepted practice, the Halakha Misa, the... Halakha, Jewish law as it is practiced. And a modern example of this is in the conversion crisis, where the Supreme Court in Israel um, uh, notes that, like, there's all these conversions, like Yonit Eretz, who converted, like, 14 years before the article was written, and then she wasn't being Orthodox enough, so the court nullified her conversion. And there's a good number of other uh, cases of this. I think there was a woman in New York who a few years after she converted she was caught wearing pants and so the rabbi just nullified the conversion right there. And so that sort of became the practice even though you're really not supposed to nullify conversions. And this, in fact this one rabbi went to the Israeli courts and argued with them about this. Like Halakha doesn't allow you to nullify a conversion retroactively. And so the guy says this, he says, I discussed Rambam, Maimonides ruling, with a prominent Dayan, that's a judge in Israel. The Rambam states unequivocally that a proselyte who was circumcised and immersed in the presence of, of three laymen is in fact a ger, a proselyte, a convert, and therefore a Jew. Even if the conversion had ulterior motives, even if the convert sub subsequently worshipped idols, he's still a Jew, just an apostate Jew. If he betrothes a Jewish woman according to Jewish law, the betrothal is valid, he's a Jew, and yeah, the marriage is valid. And he says, the Rambam, Maimonides, does not allow for retroactive annulment of conversions, under any circumstances. He you can't invalidate the conversion of a person who had imperfect motives, even one who worshipped idols immediately after the conversion. And he uses, um, I believe, the wives of Solomon as an example, that they went through the conversion with insincere motives, but they were considered valid wives. That is Maimonides' own ruling. But the Dayan answered, uh, Rambam Maimonides was speaking of a proselyte who had studied Torah and mitzvot in advance of being circumcised and immersed, and that convert, proselyte, fully accepted all of the laws to the last detail before immersing, and then after coming out, had a change of heart and went to worship idols. So if this proselyte had not known all of the commandments, and nor accepted sincerely to observe all of them originally, then the conversion wouldn't have been valid. That's the reasoning of the rabbinic authority. And so the guy asks the judge if the Maimonides meant what you just said in that paragraph. Why did he just explicitly say so? Rambam was very careful with his language, and he could easily have presented the scenario just as you described it. But he didn't. His language you know, says the exact opposite. Um, and the Dayan answered, he's like, well, Maimonides could not have meant anything other than what I say he meant. And he said this is true not just with one of these Dayan, but he's talked to multiple of these rabbinic judges, high-level rabbinic judges in Israel, and they say the same thing. Uh, Maimonides meant this, like this forced interpretation. Instead of saying that 
you can conv- you can, uh, you can convert under insincere motives or insincere motives. It's like no 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 no. Uh, these people were totally sincere before they converted, and immediately afterward, oh, they were insincere. They went back to worshiping idols, but they were sincere. Therefore, it was a conversion that was valid. Uh, just twisting the text. And of course, the guy says, this, of course, is circular reasoning. The Dion, the judge, began with the axiom that conversion equals total commitment to observe all of the commandments. If the Rambam said something in opposition to the axiom, then the Rambam needs to be reinterpreted, regardless of how far-fetched the interpretation is and how untrue it is to the Rambam's original language. And that really there is the essence of Pilpul. The idea to say, okay, we have this axiom. This is what the text means. If the text appears to say something otherwise, stretch it and force it. This is sometimes called waterboarding. Uh, I think Mike Lacone uses the term hermeneutical waterboarding. You are torturing the text until it tells you what you want it to say. And, of course, this is how these rabbinic authorities interpreted Maimonides. And here's an example of it. Even in the Talmud, before Pilpul was sort of officially introduced, there is a text in Deuteronomy that says, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, he will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him, bring him to the elders of the city at the gate of the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of the city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice, he is a glutton and a drunkard. And the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones, so you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear in fear. Now, make sure you uh, get a picture of this text, because the rabbis are about to pick the entire thing apart to make sure that this thing will never be enforced, because they don't want to be obligated to, to stone a kid. And so just by picking subtleties in the text, and this is in the Talmud Sanhedrin, they said, okay, the children, you know, the child must have been uh, between 13 and 13 and a quarter. So there's a three-month window where this is even possible because if he's younger than that, he's a minor, he can't, uh, he's not capable of being bound by the law. If he's more than 13 and a quarter years old, now he is no longer a child. So it's like it has to be within that window. And he must have stolen money from his parents and use it to buy a certain amount of meat and wine. And he must have eaten and drunk it in one go, or else he's not really a drunk and a, uh, a drunk and a glutton. Uh, and he's got to be in a place other than his parents' house because his parents would have, like, stopped him, I guess. Uh, and both parents must have turned him into the authorities willingly, both of them. And he had to have both parents if, like, one of the parents was dead or divorced or something. This is just not valid because you know it's both of his parents. And the court had warned him and whipped him ahead of time. And the mother and father are alike in height, and in voice, and in appearance. Because you know, it's talking about the voice of his mother and father. Oh yeah, so it's it's the same voice. You know, that, that's what they're you know, massaging the text to say. And so, like, this was never implemented, as uh, the Tractates and Hedron says. So why did the Torah record the case if this thing never happened? So you can study it and receive your divine reward. That's your explanation to that. And so, yeah, that is, again, part of the essence of Pilpul. There's another example in David where basically the Midrash whitewashes him with his sin with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah, where it's like, no, no, he was okay. Uriah was actually pretty evil, and David was actually justified, and so they just reinterpret everything in accordance with that. So that's that's basically the rabbinic essence of Pilpul. You'll find this as well in, like, legal discussions, um, even in secular law. This rabbinic thing continues on where you just try to find uh, minor details and force it. There's one tale I learned from, I think it was a Daf Yomi, it was a class with some rabbis, and they said there was one guy who did lobbying for legislation who was also a lawyer. And what the guy did is he sort of randomly scattered punctuation in the law so that later on, when the case went to court, he could find the punctuation and just force whatever interpretation he wanted out of it in front of the judges. I don't know if this is true, but that's very, very consistent with Pilpul. It's not so much what's the original intent of the text, it's like, what can I make this text say? And sadly, this is sort of a, an aspect of modern legal theory. But ultimately, when someone talks about Pilpul-like reasoning, let's say, uh, you know, someone's trying to twist... Um, the meaning of something or twist the meaning of your words in a discussion 
ask you to define something ad infinitum, uses trickery. That's kind of an example of pilpul. So that's pilpul for you. Shalom Aleichem.